That's my new favorite song, by the way. Didn't you love it? Yes, I was like, I'm playing it over and over and over again in the car. I love that song. And I think, I think one of the reasons why I love this song is because I know this series that we're in. And I think, yes, I mean, that is at the heart of this unexplainable series. So I love it. Um, and I'll just put another plug in. If you haven't gotten a CD, you've got to get it and just like put it in your car and this will play in your head forever. Um, uh, it, it is for me and it's good. Okay, let me just ask a quick question. How's your vision? How is your vision? Let's take a look. Do we need to have a little test? Anyone? Anyone? You've seen this before, right? Yes? Okay, let's just take, I just kind of want to see where I land in this group here. How many of you either have at some point in time or currently um, need like corrective lenses? You've uh, glasses, contacts, you know, readers. Okay, now um, let's see. How many of you, like you didn't need any of that stuff until that magic age of 40, like 40 and beyond. How many like, you didn't need glasses until you reach like, like later, right? Okay, so then how many of you had um, some sort of glasses or corrective lenses early on, maybe elementary school, middle school, that sort of, okay, you're my people. This is, you're my people, okay? So that was me. I, I really got glasses in the fourth grade, but I started needing them earlier. I didn't know any different, um, but I began to play the whole little, like leapfrog game in, in the classroom, you know, like you're sitting in the back row and you're kind of doing this with the chalkboard because they used to use chalkboards when I was in school old school, um, you know, and then the teacher would notice because she's awesome and she would go, you know what, let's, let's just move you up another row, right? And so that kept happening and happening and happening until by the time I'm in fourth grade, I am at the front, <laughs> like I can't get any closer to um, the chalkboard. And so, you know, my teacher, my parents, they were really good. They're like, let's go and take her to the, to the eye doctor. Let's give her one of these awesome vision tests and see what we need to do. So I did, I went and I had the experience that most of you had. It, you know, you, you sit there and um, this thing comes in front of you and you place your little chin right there on the thing. And then you have a pop quiz, which by the way, they should have told me that, but there's pop, better one, better two. <laughs> one, two, right? Yeah, uh-huh, you're laughing because you've done it. Um, eye doctor people, I just wanna know, do they teach you that voice in school? <laughs> Because you all have the same tone. I don't know, do you think that we're freaking out here because it's a very calming tone? I really like it, but y'all all sound the same, right? Better one, better two. And then they, you know, and turn and, and then finally, voila, you're like, oh my gosh, I can actually read the tiny little letters. Those are letters at the bottom of that chart. And, and it's great. And then they send you home and then you're like, well, now you, now you told me I'm blind and now I have to wait two weeks being blind now until my glasses come. But I remember, I remember going and picking up that, the glasses and thinking, this is awesome. Like I can see, I can see that there are trees. I can see that there are people. I can tell the difference between the two is awesome. Um, I, I have this, this amazing vision. It's like, I really thought as a fourth grader, I had bionic vision. Like I'm the coolest person ever. I can see the chalkboard. I can see when they throw the ball at me at recess. It didn't mean that I could catch it, but I could move a lot faster to get out of the way. It was great. And so, you know, I wore glasses through elementary school, middle school. Thank goodness I don't have any embarrassing photo, though, of me <laughs> in glasses. This is why I didn't really have a boyfriend until like eighth grade. <laughs> but I'm telling you, those were in fashion. I was like, I was, you know, in fashion. That's kind of what we made our kids wear. Uh, but anyway, it was great. It, it, it helped my vision. It helped the way I interacted in the world. It, it gave me, uh, I was equipped to do things that I, I couldn't do without the glasses. Uh, and then when I was 30, I had LASIK. And it was a miracle. Awesome. I mean, LASIK, how many of y'all have had LASIK? Yes, like 
oh, this is cool. I don't have to like worry about getting stuff in my contacts anymore. Um, I can actually see when I wake up in the morning. And um, it was fantastic. I had perfect vision. Actually, better than perfect because I'm an overachiever. Uh, I had 2015 vision. And I just thought, this is amazing. Having Vision, being able to see is so important. Uh, This series that we're doing, Unexplainable, uh, we are looking at how the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit comes into our lives, enters into the church, how that changes our vision, how that equips us, how that moves us forward. And and so this is what we're going to look at. We're going to be in Acts. Um, But if you... I mean, vision is not just in Acts. I mean, when we look at visions that are given, you can find stories, so many stories throughout the scriptures of people who have been given visions. So these amazing um, uh, times, moments with God from Abram back in Genesis, God gave him a vision of that his offspring would number uh, more than the stars. That Ezekiel, the prophet, actually had a vision. He was given the gift of seeing the glory of God himself. Daniel was given a vision of the future. Ananias was given a vision that caused him to do something that he totally didn't want to do that was outside of his comfort zone, but it made a huge difference. Um, Saul had a vision, literally the scales came off of his eyes and it changed his total purpose for life. So visions are incredibly important. But the question for us is, is a vision, a God-given vision, a once in a lifetime experience? I don't think so. I would actually argue that it's not. I believe that when we are praying for a vision, when we are praying to see the world as God sees the world, that we aren't praying for him to just change and correct our vision one time. But I think that what we're doing is praying for him to be our constant vision, not just to correct, but to be our constant vision. So how do we do this? Well, we've been in the book of Acts, and so we're going to look at a a scripture, some stories, to see how God uses vision um, to lead his people. Um, And what I really, really want to do is just look at one person. It's Peter. One of our favorites, Peter, right? And so we'll be in Acts chapter 10 if you wanna go ahead and get your Bibles out and get started. But just to remind us of Peter's sort of life, when Peter walked with Jesus, his um, life was pretty erratic, right? His behavior. I mean, he had those mountaintop experiences and he had the valleys. He had walking on the water and he had sinking in fear. He had speaking boldly and he had shrinking back. Like he had all that. But when Pentecost came, we remember a few weeks ago, we talked about it. It changed him. The Holy Spirit came. It changed him. He became bold. He was equipped. He um, spoke um, with such clarity that thousands came to faith. And so the Pentecost, that moment changed him. And then what we see as we walk through Peter's life from that moment is that he lived out sort of those four characteristics of the early church that Mark's been talking about, that relentless devotion, that heartfelt affection, um, the um, sacrificial giving, uh, the contagious joy. We see that as he go to the temple and he would teach and he would talk about Jesus, how he would heal people and show compassion. Uh, There's scripture of how they just brought all of their possessions and put it all together in one pile so no one would be in need. Uh, You see him live that out because it, it changed at Pentecost for him. But last week, remember Mark was talking about how persecution came, uh, And you know what? That actually happens today too. When the church stands up, when God is doing amazing things in the church, the enemy is gonna double down his efforts. And so we're going to see opposition. But 
what the enemy thought he was doing, God was gonna use it for good because the apostles scattered, which might seem to be a defeat, but it wasn't. It was actually part of God's plan that he used. Last week, Mark talked about how Philip went north to Samaria, met the Ethiopian eunuch, and because he opened up God's word to him, uh, uh, went to Ethiopia, God's word went to Ethiopia, now even a stronghold today. And then Peter, in that scattering, went northwest. He went to Lydda, he went to Joppa. So he ends up at the coast in this town called Joppa, and he's doing what he knows to do. He's living out that four, uh, those four characteristics of the early church. But meanwhile, while Peter's doing this, something is happening just 30 miles north um, with a man named Cornelius. So look at Acts chapter 10. So at Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian regiment. He and all his family, very important, were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need, prayed to God regularly. This sounds a whole lot like what we've been talking about, right? One day at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius, Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord, he asked. The angel answered, your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa. Bring back a man named Simon who's called Peter. He's staying with Simon the Tanner whose house is by the sea. And when the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants, a devout soldier who was one of his attendants, and he told them everything that had happened and sent them on to Joppa. Okay, so let's just talk for a second. Even though we're looking at the life of Peter and, and how the Holy Spirit worked in Peter, we know that God doesn't just work on one person at a time, right? So, so God is stirring. God is doing something really amazing with this man, Cornelius. Why is that important? Well, Cornelius was a Gentile, meaning a non-Jew. And yet, it says that Cornelius was a God, uh, feared God. I mean, he was a God follower. He was devout. He prayed regularly. Scholars don't really know how Cornelius came to faith. But I believe in reading scripture, what I think is happening is that we are seeing a picture of provenient grace. And we talk about provenient grace all the time, especially on Baptism Sunday. We know that God's grace, it's one grace, but we experience it different ways at different times of our lives. And before we really understand who God is and before we actually accept faith for ourselves, we know that God is stirring that God is pursuing us, that God will show himself to us in so many different ways until the time when we go, that's, that's gotta be my creator. That's gotta be, that's gotta be God. And then we, we come to faith. So what I believe that we are seeing with Cornelius is this provenient grace of God that has reached out to him. And at the same time, we see um, Peter, now, what I love about this story is that we are about to see this um, collision and we are about to see how simple obedience leads to a supernatural movement. And this is the other side of the coin from last Sunday's message where we talked about simple obedience, steps of faith. But when that happens, the other side of it is it leads to supernatural movements. Our obedience leads to the Holy Spirit doing things that we could never have even imagined at the, in the first place. So here's Cornelius. He sees this vision. He responds in faith. He sends three people to Peter. And now we see Peter, verse 9. About noon the following day as they, that's the three men, were on their journey approaching the city Peter went up on the roof to pray. By the way, I'm, about to, I'm gonna ask you in a minute what he was doing, so I'm gonna go ahead and give you the answer. What was that word? Okay, so hold on to that. 
so that you have the answer when I ask. Uh, so he bega- became hungry, wanted something to eat. While the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to the earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. And then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I've never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. Well, this happened three times. Immediately, the sheet was taken back up to heaven. And while Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. Okay, so what was Peter doing He was praying. This is so important. And I will tell you, I know this is obvious and we get it, but our prayer life affects the way we live out those four characteristics of an early church. Our prayer life, if we are um, are, uh, having a daily quiet time, daily times of prayer, where we are actually positioning ourselves um, to be in communion with God, that will affect our devotion and our giving and our joy. That will affect all of that. So Peter is doing exactly what he's supposed to do. He's praying. He's positioned himself to hear from God. Um, But he's maybe doing something a little different. And actually, he's, he's on the rooftop. Did you notice that? Now, why the rooftop? Well, the rooftop was a way to get Um, out of the hustle and bustle. It would have been a flat rooftop. Um, All the activity was going on around, down on, on street level. But if he got on the rooftop, that allowed him to get away from everything, right? To separate himself. And now, that's really important because all of us need quiet time. We need our prayer life. And, and my guess is you guys are awesome with your prayer life. I'm going to guess actually so many of you, you're probably better at it than I am. You probably have that perfect chair where you've got the perfect lamp and you've got your Bible and your little study materials and you probably get up at like three in the morning so that you can commune with the Lord for a good three or four hours and I want to be like you one day, okay? But even if that's you, even if you are so good at that, there are times when we actually need to change up our routine and do something different. Even if you are really good at sitting in that chair and reading every day, there are times when we need to do something different. Uh, it might be uh, you need to go on a walk to a maze. Um, weekend. You might need to go on a retreat. You may just need to go out and have a vacation, right? Um, that's, that's different where you intentionally look to hear and see God differently. I know that for me, that is what I needed this summer. Like I entered into the summer. It, summer's good. I mean, everything was good. I was just really tired and I had become numb, I was still praying, I was still reading, but I just, I just needed something different. And so I actually found renewal in a place I didn't expect. I found it 40 feet under the surface of the water. This summer, I discovered scuba diving, and it was incredible. I mean, it was amazing. And God used that in a way that maybe I wouldn't have gotten in my living room. But if you have ever gone scuba diving, you know this experience. I was under the water and you you can't hear anything other than your own breathing. And of course, you sound like Darth Vader. Right? But it's a little scary. But it's you, so it's okay. Um, You can't hear anything else but you can see things that you couldn't see before. And yeah, I've I've seen documentaries, I've seen pictures, but until I was under the water and experienced it for myself, I I just didn't know. It was it was just incredible. I would swim around and I thought, "Oh my gosh, there is 
All, there are all these things, the fish, yes, the sharks, um, this coral. There's, there's this beautiful life that exists under the water that I knew about, but I had never experienced before. And it was like God was reminding me, I am the creator of the universe. Like there is nowhere that you could go that I have not touched, that I'm not there. And I needed that reminder. There were things out there, and it was like, it was like God just spoke to me and, and reminded me, like, you know what? You thought that some of this might be scary, but it's not. You thought that there were things that you weren't going to be able to do, but, but you, you can. There were things that you thought were going to be pretty cool, but they were more than you could have ever imagined. And it struck me that this is a lot like our our walk, our faith walk, our journey with God, that there are things that we think we can't do, but with God, we can. There are things that we think are gonna be so scary, but with God, when he calls you to do it, it's not. And there are things you think, well, that'll be kind of cool, but with God, it's amazing. And so this for me was my spiritual retreat, was my renewal. This was a way that God opened up my eyes to see something uh, in a new way, to speak a new vision to me, to, to renew me. And so Peter he has this vision. He's positioned himself. He sees this vision and he doesn't get it. Like it doesn't make sense to him. He is confused. The, he knows as a devout Jewish man that there are things uh, that he can eat and not eat. There are things he can touch and not touch. There are places he can go and not go. And God had said, that's how it's going to be. And that's how you are going to separate yourself and make yourself holy. And yet now God's changing that up. And so Peter uh, wonders, he's confused. And, and I love that. I think he's doubting. And, and I like doubt. Doubt's not a bad thing. If, you're, if you ever doubt and think that, that you're not a good Christian because you doubt, let me just take that from you right now. I think I've said this before. It's so important. I want you to hear that. If you are doubting, then that means you're asking questions. If you're asking questions, that means you're listening for an answer. So it's okay. So if you are doubting today, it's okay. Just come and, and get someone to help you through it. So Peter is wondering, he's doubting, he's confused. But he had to also be thinking about what he experienced with Jesus. It had to come to his mind. You know, when I walk with Jesus, Jesus told us that it's not what goes into a person's body that defiles him, but what comes out. And do you know what happened, what Jesus did right after he said that? He ministered to a Gentile woman. Peter had to have been thinking, you know, I've been standing at that Jewish temple at Solomon's porch, Solomon's colonnade, telling my fellow Jewish men and and women um, about Jesus. And do you know what was right next to where I was? The court of the Gentiles. He had to be thinking, huh, you know what? I'm staying at um, a tanner's house, which by the way, a tanner um, would touch dead things and that's, you know, a no-no, right? So he had to have been uh, putting all of these little pieces together. And then what happens? God changes things and he gives him a new vision, There's a a quote from an author, um, Wayne Dyer. He says, if you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. That's pretty good, isn't it? If you change the way you look at things, then the things you look at change. I love the imagery of the golfer. You know, you, you hit the golf ball up on the, on the green and then you see those awesome professionals and they look really serious and they get on one side and they get down real low and hold up that golf club and they're looking for the straight and they get like really super low. Okay, how's it gonna break? What's gonna happen? But They don't just stop there, do they? What do they do? Then they get up, the good ones, um, they get up and they go to the other side and they change the way they look at things because there might be something on this side that I didn't see on the other side. So, So they had to change the way they were looking. 
So Peter, as he's wondering, he's doubting, he's confused, he's not sure what's happening. Um, Verse 18, they called out, asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. And while Peter was still thinking, so even in the midst, right, about the vision, the Spirit said, Simon, three men are looking for you, so get up, go downstairs, and do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. And Peter went down, said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? The men replied, we have come from Cornelius the centurion. He's a righteous, God-fearing man who's respected by all the Jewish people. And a holy angel told him to ask you to come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. And then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guests. I love that Peter acted even while he was still thinking. Even when he hadn't figured it out yet, he was not scared to be obedient in stepping out. He was willing to do what he felt like God was calling him to do, even if he didn't understand it. He knew that he needed to take small steps of obedience. What he didn't know is how huge of a movement this was about to be. What he did not know is that he was on the cusp of what has been called the Gentile Pentecost. Now, Peter was there at the Pentecost that we read about in Acts 2. When the Holy Spirit comes down, all of the Jewish believers right there, they're filled, right, with the Holy Spirit. But this is the moment when God said, you know what? I know that the enemy probably thinks making you scatter is winning. Uh Uh-uh, it's winning for me. Because now I'm gonna go out and I'm not just calling my chosen people into a relationship. I'm I'm calling everybody. Everybody, people that you didn't even expect. Those people are going to be invited into a relationship with me. God had a bigger vision that no one else knew. Now, I told you that when I was 30, I had LASIK, and it was fantastic. I mean, I loved it. And it was great for a while. But last year, I noticed that I was sitting on the couch watching the TV, you know, doing the little um, guide. And I thought that they had changed the font size because I'm like, why can't I see this? What have they done, Comcast? You know, right? Like, And of course, my husband is wonderful and loving and very helpful. And so he made a suggestion that I go see the doctor, the eye doctor. I'm like, look, I don't need to go to the doctor. I had LASIK, right? I already had my vision corrected. I'm good. And he's like, "Uh uh-huh, yep, okay. So uh, this happened for a while. Finally, I'm like, okay, I guess I have to go see the eye doctor. So I went and it turns out that as awesome as my vision had been, it had begun to blur. And the vision that had been corrected um, needed to be corrected again. And so I got these lovely things. (gasps) What? Y'all are looking so good. See, I couldn't actually see you in the back row before, but I knew you were there and now I can see you. This is what we need to do. We need to remember that even when God gives us a vision, even when we are obedient, even when we are stepping out, we can't just become complacent with our vision. Complacent, like I've already read scripture. I already know what I'm supposed to do because what we need to do is pray that God would be our constant vision because he is constantly moving. He is constantly changing. He has the bigger picture and we don't. So we need to say, Lord, please don't just correct my vision, but be my constant vision. This is what we've been thinking about for Harvest Home Groups. Now we've been excited because God has said, hey, harvest. I'm like like putting a thousand people in there for every hour and that's just awesome. And we could be complacent and say, yeah, that's good. We'll sit back now. He goes, no. Oh, that's so cute, y'all. That's just one step. I've got more. 
there are so many more people. So these Harvest Home Groups are ways for us to get out and and open our doors, invite people in that we might not have originally uh, thought of. Again, I love that song more that we, that we read. You take what I had that's small and you do an incredible thing with it. You make it even more, more than enough. That's what we're singing about. That's what our job is. And you know what? It's great. Wednesday, we had like 130 people that said, we want to open up our home. We want to be leaders. And I would say, you know, the easiest thing for us to do is to grab our little friends and say, hey, you want to come to our house? Because, you know, I know you and I like you and you're nice and that's great. But we can't be complacent there. That's not the bigger vision. The bigger vision is that God is stirring And God is beginning to call people that we don't even know. And he's gonna put people in our path. And we have to be willing to step out and say, you know what, I wanna invite you into my home. I wanna wrestle with God's word with other people. I wanna pray with you. I wanna walk with you. I wanna fellowship with you. I wanna worship with you because I believe God is doing more more than we can see, more than we can imagine, more than we could ever design for ourselves. God is doing more. And we need to be willing to take those simple steps of obedience as we see the Holy Spirit supernaturally move in this community, in this world, because the world needs God. Pray with me. Holy and gracious God, we love everything that we can see, all the different ways you've moved in our own lives and in the lives of those we love and know, but we know that there's more. We know that there is a future where you are coming again and you want every single person to be in relationship with you. So I pray that you would move us out of our comfort zone, that you would give us courage to do what we don't even know and it doesn't make sense, but it doesn't matter that we need to just step out anyway. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you would move supernaturally and do more than we could ever imagine. It is in your name that we pray those things, amen.